Welcome to church. It's so great to be together in this place. Come on, let's all stand together. If you're joining us online, welcome. Let's worship and praise Jesus. Here we go. an anthem in the making can you hear it start to rise can you hear the generations getting louder over time every son and every daughter singing out into the night it's not time to be silent don't you
this invitation for us. We sing it out. Come on, you weary. Come on, you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Come on, you sinners. Come find His mercy. Come to the table. He will satisfy. Taste of for us to come and sit at the table with him. <laughs> Scripture says he knocks at the door of our heart and he actually speaks as well and he invites us to come. And what does he wanna do? He said he wants to sit and eat with us. <laughs> he doesn't wanna come in and clean everything up first. He actually wants to come in and sit down with you and eat with you and talk to you <laughs> and me. And he is 
is worthy of us to take a moment to sit down and commune with him, amen?
deserve true glory. Sing your worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy of it all. Every part of our hearts, you are worthy of it all. Every single thing, and for from you are all things, and to you. Can we give him glory this morning? God, we are so grateful to be in your presence this morning. God, we are so grateful to be reminded that it's in your presence that everything changes. Forgive us for forgetting that we can come to you, that you actually deserve it all that you're calling us closer. Thank you, God, that you've never once left us. You've always been right with us. You're here right now. And we wanna receive this invitation to show up to your love, to your healing, to your goodness, to your kindness, to your faithfulness. Thank you for every good thing you've given us. We trust you. It's in your name we pray, amen. Amen, it's good to worship together. You can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you so much. I wanna take a minute to pray for a family that is part of our church. If the Dodies want to come up, Chris and Rob, Noah, Josh. Noah serves on our staff. Chris's mom passed away. Her name is Miriam. Chris's sister, Colleen, she comes here too, but she couldn't be here this morning, but we want to keep her in our prayers as well. If a couple of you want to come up front and stand around them, God, thank you that, that just like we pray, God, you're with us every step along the way. And there's never a time that feels okay to lose our mom. God, we know she's in heaven and we're grateful for that and we're grateful for the hope of heaven. God, we pray right now in this time that the Dodies would feel your peace that passes all understanding. They would be surrounded by comfort, that you'd fill in all the gaps in all the places where there's been a loss. Thank you, God, that your promise is that you're near the brokenhearted. And thank you, God, that we can put our hope and our trust in you. Just pray in the days, the weeks, the months to come that the Dodies would feel your presence more than ever. Thank you, God. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to take a moment, um, and we're going to do communion together. <laughs> Communion's a time where we have an opportunity to remember, remember what Jesus has done. So I'm going to read some scripture first, 1 Corinthians 11, 23. It says, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. You know, we take communion together regularly to remember. Scripture talks time and time again, return to me, return to me, remember me, return to me, remember me. This is a moment where we get to remember, and everyone's invited to participate, everyone's invited to the table. You know, I find it interesting in the scripture that it says on the night he was betrayed, Jesus broke bread with the person who would betray him. And so if you're questioning, can I take communion? I think that scripture speaks for itself. So we're gonna pass the elements in just a minute. 
um, down the rows. You can take a piece of bread and you can take a cup of grape juice and hang on to it because we're going to um, take a minute to reflect, to remember what Jesus has done while we listen to a song and worship. If you're joining online, um, you can get your stuff ready too. And if you don't happen to have cubed up bread and grape juice poured, you can probably find some animal crackers and orange juice and it will be blessed. Okay, so um, let's just remember in this moment as we listen, um, just remember what Jesus has done and the radical love he has for each and every one of you.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. you to stand please this is a sacred moment so I'm going to take just a moment to pause and give us the opportunity to examine our own hearts David wrote in Psalm 139 search me oh God know my heart test me or try me know my thoughts if there's any wicked way, any evil way, any place that I'm getting off the right path, show me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, that's our prayer today. And as we prepare our hearts to take this communion, we do it to remember you. So let's hold the bread. The bread represents the broken body of Jesus, broken for you and for me so that we could be healed and whole. And as we receive it, we do it with thanksgiving, so let's eat. Now let's hold the cup. This cup represents the blood that was shed when Jesus was on the cross, the blood that was shed when the crown of thorns went on his head, when his back was whipped, flogged, when the nails pierced his hands and feet, and when the spear went in his side. But there was a purpose to that shed blood. It was for the forgiveness of our sins. And so today as we drink this cup, we do it with thanksgiving. Let's drink. You can just hold on to your cups, dispose them after the service. But God, we're here today and we are so thankful. As we, re we remember what Jesus did so many years ago. Lord, I pray that it would just open our eyes to who you are. There's no other name in heaven or on earth or under the earth for which men and women will be saved. It's the name of Jesus. And so I pray, God, that we would know you. Not just know about you, we would know you. And we would do everything we can to share who you are with the people around us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we all said, amen. Amen. Would you just remain standing? Uh, before we get into the message, I want to invite Mandy Johnson to come back up here. Uh, Mandy, if, if you've gone through Count Me In, you would have uh, gotten to know Mandy. She serves as service host, of course, and does a great job um, over the Connections team and, and many other uh, places around here, Worship Center. But Mandy will be transitioning off of our staff, taking a new role. Uh, you've been serving on staff the last six years, and then prior to that, for another four-year stint, so about 10 years, I think. Is that right? Uh, almost 10, and she'll be taking a position with Good Samaritan Services, which is the organization Worship Center has been partnering with, and Good Samaritan does an incredible work by uh, supporting many single moms and families who are in need with housing and other ways, and so Mandy will be taking a position there, uh, and I believe utilizing your gifts and abilities and heart for families in need, and I just thought you should know, and I also want to pray for her. Uh, she takes on this new responsibility. So she's not going anywhere. She just won't be on staff. So uh, could we pray? Lord, thank you for the, the direction and the clarity that you brought Mandy as she's heading into a new opportunity, new challenge, new uh, responsibility. And Lord, we pray for your continued blessing on her and her family, her three girls. We thank you for uh, the opportunities that she'll have to share what you've done in her life and, and uh, reach out to so many people who are in need. And so... Uh, I pray your continued blessing on 
them as a family. I pray your blessing on Good Samaritan services, and we just thank you for uh, the work that the kingdom of God is, is accomplishing here in this local area. And so we're grateful for that. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. amen. Thank you for your years of service here. We really do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. That's not the gift for working at Worship Center. In case you were wondering, we do that in our staff meeting. So she asked, should I take your communion cup? So it's her last act of service here, I guess. <laughs> service host. Well, are you ready for the word of God today? Boy, our hearts are ready. I just feel this leaning in for God's word. And so um, my prayer is that God would speak to you through his word to your situation and that it would change you today. If you're watching online, I pray that it would change you today. So I wanna go to Acts chapter 16 and I wanna read verses 16 through 25. So just remain standing if you're able as a way we honor the reading of God's word. Verse 16 says, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days, finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around. Aren't you glad that uh, we know that the people in the Bible are human beings? They're like real people who get annoyed. I'm so glad. That makes me feel better when I get annoyed in certain situations. He became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, everybody say midnight. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Now, I want to jump over to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, just one verse, and I want to invite you to read this out loud together. Ready? For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Amen. Are you thankful for God's word today? Yeah, I really believe it's gonna speak to your life, to your heart. Spirit God gave us does not make us timid. It gives us power, love, and self-discipline. I wanna talk today from the subject that is my title, a midnight song. Talk about a midnight song. And so before you're seated, just turn to the per person next to you and find the person who had the best singing voice today and just let them know just say, uh, neighbor, it's easy to sing a song when the sun is shining. Oh, but it takes great faith to lift up a midnight song. All right, Lord, have your way today in Jesus' name. You can be seated. We're going to have some fun today. Thank you, team, for leading us. Oh, William back there, thank you. That was beautiful. Have you ever had a song get stuck in your head? Have you ever had a song on replay in your head? Um, I've written a few songs, not recently, but I've written a few songs in my life, and I used to think that the sign of a good song was that the melody would get stuck in your head. I used to think that until I realized that most of the songs in my head were jingles from commercials. <laughs> and they have this power.
power to stay in your head. You ever notice that? I mean, I can prove it to you today. Can you fill in the rest of this jingle? Like a good neighbor. And what, I mean, come on, that's amazing. The power of a jingle. Uh, did you know that that was written, that little jingle, State Farm Insurance jingle, was written by Barry Manilow? Did you know that? That's before he became famous, he was writing commercial jingles. And it was written about 50 years ago in the early 70s. And here we are 50 years later, we still know the message from that song. There's some power in a melody. And so why, why do songs get stuck in our heads? Why, why do they stay on replay? And so uh, scientifically, there are a few different theories, but uh, what's been discovered is that when you hear a song, you hear, a music play, you hear music playing, it triggers the part of the brain called the auditory cortex. And the best way that I can explain this is that when you hear that song, the audio, it, it triggers in your brain, in that part of your brain, and it gives you like a brain itch, almost like a mosquito bite. And so the more it itches, the more you want to scratch it, and the more you scratch it, the more it itches. And so it's the cycle, and that song stays on replay. But psychologists actually tell us that uh, when a song gets stuck in your head, it actually strengthens the memory of the event for which that song coincided with. In other words, we could say it this way, um, the memory of that song, or the song that that memory was connected to, or that moment was connected to, actually strengthens the memory of that moment. Like a song helps you remember that, that moment. That's why if you think back to ver the very first concert that you've gone to, you can probably remember a lot of details of that first concert, if you think back to it. I mean, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But can you remember what happened 24 hours before that concert or 24 hours after? There is power in a song. God actually created, I mean, this is our creator God. He gave us this gift of music that helps us remember particular events or information. And so today I wanna talk about a midnight song. What is a midnight song? Here's my definition for it. A midnight song is a way to remember that God is with us. A midnight song is a way to remember that God is for us and not against us. That no matter what we face in life, there is a track playing that God will not neglect you. A midnight song. But you know, you gotta choose, you gotta make sure you choose the right song to keep on replay. And so in this text, Acts chapter 16 that we read, uh, really to get to the context of this text, I wanna go to the beginning of the book of Acts. And the book of Acts was written by Luke, the physician who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, and the very first chapter, Acts chapter one, Luke records this moment, this final moment that Jesus has with his disciples. Before Jesus ascends to heaven, he says these words to his disciples. He says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall receive this power. And what is the purpose of this power? The purpose of this power isn't to say, I'm super spiritual. It's not to say I've got you know, extra strength now. The purpose of this power, Jesus said, is to be my witnesses. And a witness is not going around telling people how they should live their life. A witness simply shares what they've seen and heard and experienced. So we wanna be a witness for Jesus or witness of Jesus. We just simply share what we've experienced and how he's changed our lives. That's what being a witness is. And so Jesus said, I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And they represent circles that we live in. Jerusalem rep rep represents the hometown. I want you to be my witnesses in your family, in, with your family, in your home, in your community, in your workplace, the marketplace, the people you work with, and in Judea, that's a little bit broader. You know, being a uh, witness in throughout Lancaster County in the state of Pennsylvania, if we were saying it for today, and in Samaria. And this would have been a little bit shocking to Jesus' disciples because the Jewish people were the enemies to the Samaritans, and the Samaritans were the enemies to Jewish people. And so Jesus essentially was saying, I want you to be my witness to both your friends and your enemies, to the people who look like you and the people who don't look like you, the people who vote like you and the people who don't vote like you. 
be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so the disciples, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and then led by Peter and John, they begin to be the witnesses for Jesus. And they start preaching about the kingdom of God, preaching about who Jesus is. Many people were being saved. Many people were becoming Christians. And miracles were being performed. And this community of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, all into the ends of the earth, started in that moment. But there was opposition, there was resistance. There was opposition by Rome, the Roman government that uh, they were living under. They did not want this religion, this Christianity to be spread. So there was opposition coming from the Roman government and there was opposition coming from the religious establishment, the Jewish religious establishment. They saw it as a threat to their religion. So they were trying to stop this Christianity, talking about who Jesus was. And there was a man named Saul of Tarsus and he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was zealous. He was, uh, you know, very educated. He had, he could speak five different languages fluently, and and he um, knew the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, inside and out. And he saw this Christianity as a threat, and so he would was going around thinking he was following God's mission. Uh, he was going around arresting Christians and having them thrown in prison. And on one of those missions, he was heading to Damascus. And on the way, he, he sees this bright light and he's knocked down to the ground and he has an encounter with Jesus that changes his life, changes his name. He's baptized by the, with the Holy Spirit. He's water baptized. And now he becomes a witness to how Jesus has changed his life. And what he was working against, now he's working for. That's what Jesus will do. He'll change your life. The thing that you thought was honoring God, when you see clearly, it changes your life, changes your perspective, and God gives you a new mission. And so uh, the apostle uh, Paul, his name was changed to Paul, uh, he's going around and he has all of these different uh, regions that he's in, in, in Asia Minor, in Europe, and he starts spreading this gospel, who Jesus is, building about the kingdom of God, and um, he's on this mission. I actually want you to see the region he was in so, uh, of course, he's Saul of Tarsus, and he was in, you know, heading to Damascus when he had an encounter with Jesus, and now he's going through all of these different cities. So if you're familiar, familiar with the New Testament, uh, he went to the city of Colossae, started a church there, and then wrote the letter Colossians, wrote a letter to the church in Colossians. That's how he got the name of these letters in the New Testament. Ephesus, planted a church there, wrote the letter Ephesians. Uh, Thessalonica, Corinth, again, he writes these letters there. Acts chapter 16 takes place in Philippi. Eventually, he will write a book called Philippians to that church, but this Acts chapter 16 happened prior to that. Now, Philippi was a Roman colony, so here you have Rome, remember, looks like the boot there uh, in Italy, but Philippi is a Roman colony. What, what that means is the emperor of Rome ordered Roman citizens to live in some of these cities so that they would be, have a Ro like Roman DNA, and so those Roman citizens would have to vote a certain way. They'd have to be loyal to the emperor. Uh, they would be pro-Roman uh, government. They'd, they would um, really just live and make sure that the, the, what Rome looked like and Rome, Italy would look like in Philippi. In exchange for their loyalty, they would be exempt from uh, paying taxes and have other political privileges. So Paul, the Apostle Paul going into these regions, I mean, we owe so much to Paul, and I think so much respect should go to him because he was doing extraordinary work in very difficult situation. And so when he's in this region doing incredible work, we see him, his life, have impact. And I want us to see three characteristics from Paul that, that we see in his life that we can learn today because anytime we approach the scripture, anytime we look at these stories that are more like narrative stories, it's important to, to look at, okay, what's true about this and why is this passage relevant for us today here in 2021? And what I see in this passage, what I want you to see today is this, that God has given us the ability to, I'm gonna give you all three points right up, right up front. He's given us the ability to be bold, to have confidence in our faith, to be bold in our witness and how we share how Jesus has changed our lives. God has given us the ability. It's available to us to be bold. Number two, it's the ability to be loving, to love one another as Christ has loved us, 
to be an example of Christ's love to our, in our homes, in our communities, in our workplace, to be examples for other people to understand how, does, how did Jesus love the world? He should see it in his followers. And he's given us the ability to, number three, be self-disciplined. Self-disciplined. Pulling that right from 2 Timothy 1.7. Now, let's dig into this passage in Acts 16 because we're gonna see evidence of all three of these. So on the way, it starts out, they were on the way to the place of prayer. You know, so many significant spiritual growth moments, so many of them happen in the mundane, ordinary moments in life if we're paying attention to it. And I think sometimes we're looking for those dramatic light bulb, you know, road to Damascus encounter with Jesus. But most of the spiritual moments in life come from the everyday, mundane, routine parts of life. And we see how God meets people right in those ordinary moments. And so they're on the way to prayer. There's a slave girl, fortune teller, who's you know, going around bothering Paul. And finally he gets so annoyed and he, he frees this slave girl, frees her from the oppression of this spirit, this de- demonic spirit, and she's free but there's always a cost to freedom. And the cost of freedom came to her owners. And so the owners went and they're really, their only recourse was to go to the, to the authority, the magistrates, and just say, first off, number strike one, these guys are Jewish. And strike two is that they're trying to spread a religion that has not been approved by the Roman government. And so a crowd forms, there's a mob mentality, and the magistrates, I think, probably under political pressure as well as trying to you know, not, not get the attention of the Roman government, they have Paul and Silas that stripped of their clothes, beaten, and then imprisoned. And that's the thanks that Paul and Silas get for being witnesses, obeying what Jesus gave his disciples to do. Have you ever experienced some kind of injustice, some kind of uh, something that seems unfair when you're trying to follow Jesus? Have you ever experienced that? How do you handle being treated unfairly? I mean, we get consequences when you do something wrong. Yeah, there's a consequence for that. But what about when you do something right and you feel like you're being punished for it? How do you handle that? Well, Paul he handled it amazingly. And maybe he remembered that, hey, this situation, it's only a test. I'm only being trained and developed for something greater in the future. And so when Paul and Silas, they are thrown in prison, they'd already been severely flogged, beaten. And I mean, if you understood what flogged was, it's not just someone tapping you, you know, with a ruler when you disobeyed in school. I mean, it, they were being whipped And then when they were in prison, their feet were put into stocks. And we might have this picture in our mind, you know, feet and hands and stocks. When you go to Disney World and, you know, you put your hands through and you have to just stand there and everyone kind of laughs at you and takes your picture there. And maybe it's like, oh, wow, they were really punished. Somebody threw a pie at them or something. But that's not what stocks were. When they put their feet in stocks, what they did is they put the chains around their feet, pulled them as far tight as possible like a spread eagle, into a painful position and just left them there in the inner prison. It was, a, it was a way of torture. That's what they were experiencing after being whipped, flogged, in these stocks, tortured, and in that moment at midnight, they prayed and sang. Now, I get praying. <laughs> because if I was in that moment, I'd be praying too. I'd be saying, God, what's up with this? Why did I deserve this? Can you set me free? And I, my prayer would sound a little bit more like complaining probably. And God can handle our honest prayers. But the fact that they prayed, that's not a surprise to me, but the fact that they prayed and sang, there was something bigger going on. There was a source that they pulled from that they could sing a midnight song. See, a midnight song is a song you've sung before. It's not the first time you've sung it. A midnight song is a song that you sing in good times and hard times. A midnight song is a song that you sing on the mountaintops and in the valleys. When you're made to lie down in green pastures by the still waters and when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. 
And I'm here to ask you, do you have a midnight song? Do you have a song stuck on repeat when you are what feels like being punished for doing good? When you are in what feels like prison, when you're in a dark place, when you've been criticized, when you've been beaten, do you have a midnight song? See, a midnight song will change the atmosphere. A midnight song will change your attitude. A midnight song will keep your feet planted, keep your faith steadfast. A midnight song is gonna replay, and it's a way to remember that God is with us. Do you have a midnight song? What is your midnight song? Paul and Silas, in that moment, they were singing, and the other prisoners heard them. I think that is such an important detail because a midnight song will influence the people around you. It will change the atmosphere, not just in your life, but the people you uh, live with and work with. Let's keep reading verse 26. After they're at midnight, they're singing, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose, and you can imagine that the fear of God came on those prisoners. They heard the midnight song, and now there was an earthquake, and their chains came off. Next verse, the jailer woke up, whoops, he was sleeping on the job, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. And Roman law was that if a jailer or a prison guard lost a prisoner, that that guard would have to endure the same punishment for what that prisoner was in prison for. And so this jailer decided it was better for him to commit suicide than to be shamed and be executed in a shameful way. That's the state he was in. Verse 28, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. Paul got in, he took control, commanded the situation. He said, don't harm yourself. We are all here. And this, of course, would have stunned the jailer. So the jailer called for the lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. The jailer then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And that's a question every person needs to ask. Wherever, whatever your journey has been, whether you grew up in church all your life or whether you're new to church, every person needs to ask this question, what must I do to be saved? Every person needs to ask a question and every follower of Jesus needs to have, know what the answer is to that question. Because there are a lot of opinions and a lot of religions pointing to the way of salvation. And there are a lot of directions that people say, oh no, this is the way, this is the way, but there's only one way, one truth, and one life, and his name is Jesus. And that's what Paul did. He was not concerned about his own well-being in that moment. He was concerned about this jailer, about his heart, his soul. Not only did he save his physical life, but he was able to answer that question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they reply, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Very simple, believe in the Lord Jesus. Yeah, I know there, you could go to church, you can uh, have all of these different religious practices, but the way to salvation is to believe in the Lord Jesus. That's it, you will be saved. Really, that seems so simple. Grace simplifies what religion complicates. They reply, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household, meaning it's available to you and your family, not you just in your situation. This salvation is available to every person. Then they spoke the word of the Lord. Paul and Silas spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And this is what I love about the jailer's response. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And immediately, he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And that family was changed because of Paul, the way Paul handled himself when he was in prison. 
And I, I love how the jailer responded to this because true repentance is not just about getting your life right with God and, and you, you know, believing in Jesus and experiencing forgiveness for your sins. It's not just a vertical relationship. The true repentance is actually going to cleanse the wounds that you may have given to someone else. And he went and cleansed those wounds, some that he probably created and some that were created by others. That's true repentance. When we repent of our sins, it's not just getting our life right with God, it's actually making sure our life is okay with the people around us and going back to those who we may have hurt, asking for forgiveness, making sure it's right. That's true repentance. What an incredible story. We see how Paul how his life, how he handled being in prison, how he was more concerned about the one who actually caused him pain. He was more concerned about his soul than his own well-being. And we see not just the jailer, but his whole household come to know Jesus, be saved. How is this story relevant to us today? It's a nice story, it's a great narrative, but how is this story relevant for us today? What I want you to see in Paul's life, the same power that was available for Paul is available to you. Let's go back to 2 Timothy 1.7. For the spirit God gave, we read this already, does not make us timid. It does not make us timid. What's your definition of the word timid? What do you think of when you see that word timid? Maybe shy, uh, maybe afraid, maybe scared maybe stressed out, maybe anxiety. The spirit God gave us does not make us timid. It gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Here's the definition of timid. Timid means lacking in self-assurance, courage, or bravery, bravery, easily alarmed. Now, how many of you know we have opportunities in the world that we live in to be easily alarmed? We live in crazy times. The world we live in right now is crazy, right? Maybe it's always been crazy, I don't know. But it seems really crazy right now. And maybe it will always be crazy. But you know you you don't have to be easily alarmed even living in a crazy world. The spirit God gave us does not make us timid. Do you find yourself being easily alarmed by what's going on in our culture? Do you find yourself being easily alarmed by what's going on in your personal life and your situation right now? The spirit God gave does not make us timid. That word timid comes from the same root word that Jesus used so often throughout the gospels when he would say, don't be afraid. He used it in this moment when he and his disciples got in a boat, he said, hey, we're gonna go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee And while they're in the boat on the Sea of Galilee, a big storm comes. And you know what Jesus is doing during that storm? He's sleeping. The only recorded, as far as I know, the only recorded moment that has Jesus sleeping. Now we know he probably slept other times. The only recorded moment when Jesus is sleeping is while he's with his disciples in a boat in the middle of a storm. Do you think that's coincidence? And so when the disciples were in there, I mean, these were experienced fishermen. They had been through storms on the Sea of Galilee many times. But this storm was severe, and it was so severe that they finally came and woke Jesus up. Do you know what they said to him? They didn't say, Jesus, would you help us get water out of the boat? They didn't say, Jesus, can you do something about this storm? Do you know what they said? They said, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown and die today? Have you ever had that question for God? Don't you care that I lost my job? Don't you care that I've been betrayed by a close friend? God, don't you care that the dream that I thought was from you is shattered? And our compassionate Savior wakes up from his nap says a few words, peace be still, the storm calms down, and then he turns and just the love, you can just, you can feel the love coming from him. He looks at his disciples and he says, why were you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Our compassionate savior, right? 
See, I thought Jesus in that moment would be like, hey, come bring it in, guys. Sorry about the storm. Man, I didn't realize I fell asleep. I was so tired from, you know, feeding 5,000 people and it's been a long week. <laughs> but he didn't say any of that. He said, why do you have such little faith? Why are you afraid? It's the same word. He wasn't saying, why are you scared? Of course, there are lots of opportunities to be scared in life. He wasn't saying, don't be scared. He was saying, don't be easily alarmed. The spirit God gave make, does not make us timid, but it makes us, it gives us power to be bold. It gives us the ability to love one another as Christ has loved us. And that final one is self-discipline. And that's the word that's jumping out at me. The spirit God gave us empowers us, helps us to be self-disciplined. Here's what self-discipline means. Self-discipline, by definition, means calm, well-balanced mind, sound judgment, and self-controlled. And being self-disciplined showed up for Paul in the prison. Being self-disciplined, God was, Jesus was saying, this is available to you in a prison, it's available to you in a storm, and it's available to you in your uncertainty in your life. The ability to stay calm, well-balanced, have sound judgment, and stay self-controlled, that is a gift that the Spirit of God has made available to you and to me. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you might be wondering, how, how, do you, how do you know? How do you know about the Holy Spirit? You can't see it. Well, Jesus explained it this way. He said, it's like the wind. The Spirit of God is like the wind. You cannot see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. You can't see, you can't tangibly see it. You can't even really describe wind, but you can describe how, where it comes from and where it goes. You can describe the impact of the wind, and it's the same way with the Spirit of God in our lives. The gift, the, this gift, we don't earn it. There's nothing we have done to deserve it. It's this gift, the Holy Spirit empowers us, gives, us, gives the ability to be bold, to be loving, and to be self Discipline, meaning have a sound judgment, have a well-balanced mind, stay calm, be self-controlled in the midst of any circumstances. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the Holy Spirit I want you to walk in. And I can pray that for you, and I can desire it for you, but if you want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're gonna have to desire it. It comes to a soul that's hungry and humble. It comes to a soul that is, wants to receive it. Do you want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? And see, a midnight song is the way to remember that God has given us the ability. God has given, God's the one who has given us the ability to walk through life. What is your midnight song? What is the song that's playing in your mind? How many of you would like to trade your song of doubt for a new song? A new song that's built on God's word, faith, trusting him. In the valley, in the mountaintop, where goodness and mercy are and through the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, there is a midnight song that God wants to give every person. And he wants you to have that. I wanna invite you to stand. I'm gonna take just a few moments. I don't want anyone to leave. Again, these are sacred moments. When we're gathered together, these are sacred moments because they impact our spiritual lives, the spiritual part of our, of our being. And we can't always explain everything. We do the best we can to help us understand, but there's a certain level of mystery around faith. And I know there's some, maybe some of you, I feel like I can read some of your minds, you know, well, isn't it just, you know, self-discipline? Isn't that just being self-disciplined? Why do you need the Spirit of God? It's not just being mature and responsible and being a grown up, being an adult. There is a source to walk through life where you're not relying on yourself because if you're only relying on yourself as the source of your strength, that will run out at some point. 
but there's a source available that will keep you calm, it will keep you well minded, that give you a clear mind, to help you make good decisions that is available every day of your life no matter what you face, so that you can be a witness to what Jesus has done in your life. Can we thank God for his word today? Can we praise him for what he's done? Our team's gonna lead us in a song, and I want, to, I want to just invite you in this moment, if you wanna be refilled with the Holy Spirit today, I wanna to invite you, you can, if you don't have to, but you can, just put your hands up, just as a way of saying, I'm ready to receive. I'm ready to receive. Put yourself in a humble posture, a hungry posture for more of God in your life, and let there be a new song that rises out of you, who God is. Yeah, you might be facing something that's big, but I want you to know we have a big God. And in the presence of our big God, our problems are, are, begin to look small. In the presence of a big God, our problems begin to look um, manageable. In the, in the presence of our God, because our attention is on him and not on our problems, we begin to see God is for you and not against you. Come on, can we worship him this morning? And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. bow your heads for a moment. Lord, today I pray for every person who would, has a desire to be filled with your Holy Spirit today. It is a gift. The power of the Holy Spirit is a gift. Nothing we do to earn it. There's nothing we can do to, that, that we, makes us deserve it, but it is a gift. And so I pray, God, that you would refill today. For those who feel like they're in a dry season right now, God, the wind, let, let there be a fresh wind in their sails. Let there be a cool breeze in what seems so dry. God, I pray that you would fill them with the, the living water that never runs out. God, for those that, that need clarity and need decision or making decisions and they, there's confusion right now, God, I pray that you, the spirit of truth would, would be so clear and, and bring wisdom in that situation. And God, for those who have never made a decision to follow you, never made a decision to surrender you, and they're asking that question today, what must I do to be saved? God, my prayer is they would have the courage 
to go after that answer. And if that's you, if you're watching online and you're asking that question, what must I do to be saved? Or if you're here in the room and you're asking that question, what must I do to be saved? I'm here to tell you, it's not just knowing more about Jesus. It's not just gaining more information. It's not just knowing about him. I want you to know him personally. And that first step is to believe. And there may be some of you who are here today, some of you who are listening to this, and you still have some doubts. You still have some questions, and you're waiting for those doubts to go away. You're waiting for those questions to be answered. And then you'll make that decision. And I'm here to tell you, take the step now. Place your faith, believe who Jesus is first even in the midst of your doubts and your questions. That's the invitation Jesus gave his followers. That's the invitation I want you to receive. So if you're ready to place your faith in Jesus, believe who he is, even in the midst of your doubts, I wanna lead you in a prayer. And I'm just gonna invite you to repeat this prayer after me as a decision that you make today. This is a defining moment for your life. And would you just say this? I, want, I mean, we can all say this just so no one's praying by themselves. But I want you to repeat this after me. Just say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I believe he's the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. And I believe he rose from the dead to give me new life. Today, I repent of my sins and receive forgiveness for my sins. And I choose Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. My old life is gone, and a new life has begun. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, come on, can we thank God for the power of the gospel? The power of the gospel is what saves all men, all women, all people. Over the past few weeks, we've had a number of people respond, making these decisions. So if you made that decision today, you are not alone. This is a family, we're together. But if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you know you needed to get your life right with God. Would you just put your hands straight up in the air, unashamed of this decision? The ushers have a gift for you, see a hand there. Come on, can we thank God for these individuals? <clears throat> Listen, this decision sets you on a path this decision sets you on a path. I'm proud of you for making it in this kind of environment. It's big, I know we have somebody over here. Um, but I wanna invite you to take that Bible. If you need a Spanish Bible, we have those in connections. But I wanna encourage you to stay connected. That's why we call the rooms connections, because we don't want you to forget. Being connected in a local church is so critical to spiritual growth because journey of faith is not meant to be walked alone. Christianity is a community faith. We learn, we grow from each other. So stay connected. And I don't invite you to stop by connections after the service. If you're watching online, make sure you text the word alive to that number on the screen so we can connect with you directly and personally. All right. Well, are you thankful for God's word today? Boy, I, I pray that it encourages you and challenges you. Uh, just remain standing. Please don't go anywhere. Uh, before you go, I just want to give you an opportunity to give financially to Worship Center. And um, it's a way we support the local church. You know, if, if tithes and offerings, when we bring our tithes, we bring that first per, uh, portion, what God has given to us, into the local church. It's how we have a fully funded local church to be a storehouse to the people that are part of Worship Center and to our community and all around the world. So when you give, you get to participate in building the kingdom of God, getting the mission and the vision of what we're doing here, and really the gospel of who Jesus is all around the world. So if you'd like to give, uh, thank uh, you can look on the screen. If you have been giving, thank you. If you'd like to start giving, you can see how to do that online. You can also drop your gifts in the box here at the entrance too. But so grateful for such a generous church and uh, how you invest into the kingdom of God. All right, before you go, let's pray this blessing over each other making this a practice. Uh, we can just say it out loud and just consider the people around you that you're praying a blessing over them. Ready, here we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may he give you his peace. That's the peace I want you to experience. Have a fantastic rest of your weekend. Good week, we'll see you here next weekend. Let's stay connected.